So thank you again for doing this. It means a lot to me. And not, not just that I'm getting to meet you here again and do this, but you're, that you've answered your call to write about this theology that is so important and necessary and redeeming and full of possibilities. Um, you know, we talk in Judaism about repairing the world. And I think what you've laid out in your thinking is how to repair the world. So I'm just so grateful, so grateful that you follow whatever, whatever that voice or call inside of you has been. It, uh, it helps people like me who are seeking God anywhere I can find him or her with um, a plausible path that uh, allows me to lead a more sacred life. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate what you just said. I'm part of the Tikkun movement. <laughs> but um, I disagree with, I just agree with so much of what you you stand for what you've learned, what you're sharing, you know, that we're in this postmodern time. And I like to put it out post Piscean time, we're in the age of Aquarius. And that is a time of togetherness, you know, or else, or the opposite. I mean, you know, Carl Jung said that in the age of Aquarius, evil will no longer be under the table. It'll be on top of the table. We can all see it, but will we be able to act? I think he really has something there, you know, that, I mean, you look at what's going on. I just, during our break, I just read the latest thing about the Supreme Court. Gorsuch, it turns out, and if you heard this, it's just today's news. He <laughs> got someone to pay for his house nine days after he was made a Supreme Court judge. And the guy has had 23 uh, uh, moments before the Supreme Court since he's been in China. I mean, it's, and, and the writer said this was just as big as what we've been going on with Clarence Thomas. So, I mean, you know, the times we're in, it, in some ways, it's just so obvious. What evil is, it's obvious, you know, and what Putin is doing and all this. And and what we're all not doing, <laughs> since our mission regarding the environment, and Mother Earth, and women, and so many other issues, but, um, wow, you know, we've just got to rattle things, rattle things up. And religion itself has to be, well, to use Howard Thurman's term, stripped down to the literal substance of itself before God. And, uh, yeah, so that is the battle I've been fighting. I've been trying to undo. Well, deconstruct, I guess, is a contemporary word. The Christianity as I was taught it. But to find it, what I call the treasures in the burning building take them out and to travel light, you know, spiritually. That's why we want spirituality, not religion. You know, I talk about traveling not with basilicas on our back, but backpacks, you know. And that's what you've been doing. And, and you realize, like you say, there's common ground. There's there's no other that, you know, I read your stories from swamis and from hippies and from Buddhists and from Christians and Jews and all. And that's what we want. We want the essence of the thing. You know, all the details. They're interesting and they're, it's fine. It's just like people wear different outfits and eat different diets. That is wonderful diversity in the human race. But to make them uh, the only way to the divine, my way is the only way, or something like that, and then go to war about it, or with the rest, and what we've been doing for years, thousands of years, it's, um, you know, we gotta grow up and get out of all that. So that's, well, that's where I think the word creation spirituality makes sense, because we all have creation in common. Like I said in my Cosmic Christ book, there's no such thing as a Roman Catholic rainforest and a Buddhist ocean and a Methodist moon and a Lutheran sun, and, um, once we realize that, put our religions into context, then we're going to chill out a little, calm down, and maybe we'll start looking for one another's wisdom and, uh, and see how we can link up on that, you know, and, and do the tikkun thing, save the world, uh, heal the world. So, um, I don't know, it's not rocket science.
what do you think is the work? You know, I'm, I'm deeply moved by that uh, statement by Thomas Merton that uh, I have to get the impulse for war out of myself mm. first. Um, instead of hating the other, I need to find that inside of myself and root that out. Um, and that has really spoken to me. Um, but this idea of do we show up fighting in the world, fighting injustice, or do we show up loving the world? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you think is the work? <laughs> well, I think it's both and. <clears throat> the loving is what I call, and I think the tradition does, is the mystic. The mystic is the lover. But that's not enough. We also have to defend what we love. And uh, that's the prophet. What Heschel, whose job Heschel says, Rabbi Heschel, is to interfere. And that means to stand up to, to, to defend what we cherish. So it's both and. And um, you might say that the mystical is a more feminine dimension. The prophet is the more masculine. It's, it's also the warrior, that kind of energy. But uh, that doesn't mean that women are only mystics or prophets are only men. No. It, the good prophets, you talk about Jesus, you talk about King, you can talk about Gandhi, you can talk about um, um, the fellow in South Africa. I'm sorry, his name's the name. I need you to announce the name sometimes. Go in and out. Mandela. Mandela. And um, they had have this mystical side to them, as well as the prophetic side. They're remembered, perhaps, for the prophetic side. But um, the truth is that their prophetic side wouldn't have been so successful if they didn't have these other elements to it. Uh, and creativity is, is right in the center between the, the falling in love of the of the via positive and the mystic, and the suffering of the via negative, the emptying, the dark night. But then comes the creativity, the, the renewed imagination. Perchenu calls it rupture. That rupture, and that's a powerful name for the via negative, right? for chaos, for everything falling apart, right? Um, uh, the Buddhist nun writes about Pima Chodron, the, 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 when things fall apart. And everything's falling apart today. It's obvious everywhere. There's no profession that's, that's in decent shape. So when things fall apart is when imagination gets stirred and you move then from rupture to what Chanu calls again um, presence. Yeah. That's his, it's interesting. I, I like to look at the naming mm -hmm. of the mystical experience. And it's so interesting. Thomas Aquinas uses the word ecstasy which I also use, with, and I used it early in my writing before I'd seen it in Aquinas. Um, because ecstasis means to stand out of, it's kind of moving beyond the ego or your usual view of the world. But So ecstasy is a good word, but um, Eckhart uses the word breakthrough, which he invented in German, Dirkbrook, breakthrough, which is a powerful word. He says, in breakthrough I learn that God and I are one. And Julia Norris uses the word oneing, O-N-E-I-N-G. She invented that word in English. She invented a lot of words in English. First woman to write a book in English in the 14th century, she was. And, um, but Chanu uses the word presence. And I think it's an interesting word because he's an activist. He took on the Vatican. He took on education. He took on uh, work uh, with the work of priest movement. And I mean, he, he and, and he, he, uh, he launched really the liberation theology movement. But that word presence is really a very mystical word. But I think it's very real for people. It's kind of, you can ask the question, where do you feel the presence of spirit? Where do you feel the presence of God? And, and you, you do a wonderful job of getting those answers out of people in your book. You really do. And it's so interesting. And, and everyone has their story to tell. You know, it's not, it's not cookie cutter here. I'll tell you a story if I can. I, tell me if I'm talking too much, but you... No, I'm, we're going to move into some questions I have, but go ahead. Okay. You're good. Years ago, this important story to me, as I get older, I, I one of my books was out and translated into Dutch. So I was in Holland being interviewed on a 
public station. Of course, Harland is this big, so it's just the national station. By a very intelligent young man, I'd say he's about 40, 39, and, um, and it was live, and then it was over, and the, the lights went out, the uh, floodlights that you had back then. And he leaned over in his chair and he said, I've got to ask you something I couldn't ask on air. I said, oh, what's that? It's going to be interesting, I said to myself. He said, do you North Americans, do you Americans still believe that you can have experiences of God? I just thought that was so interesting that, first of all, he was passionate about his question. Secondly, he couldn't answer it. He couldn't ask it on, on air. And thirdly, it, it sounded like no one in Europe <laughs> has an experience of God. So I just found that very striking because to me, that's what spirituality is. And that's where religion often fails. It, it's so involved with, with itself, with structures and hierarchy and rules and canon laws and, and mistakes <laughs> and, and schools and buildings. And oh my God, there's so much going on, but where does the experience of God get addressed? And that's why I said years ago in my 20s, <clears throat> during my education as a Dominican, I went to my superiors and said, my generation would be less interested in religion, more interested in spirituality. Spirituality is the experience of the divine. And I said, you don't have anyone here that doctor in spirituality. No one talks about it. You know, we do it, supposedly, our vows and our chanting and our fasting and all this. But, um, you know, we need some theory, too. <laughs> and I, so I said, you got to send someone on, and I'm, I'm glad to volunteer. And, and uh, a few months later, they came back and said, great, you got permission. You can go to your, for a doctor. I said, great, where do I go? They said, go to Spain. I said, Spain? I said, we don't need more 16th century Carmelite spirituality. No, thank you. Well, they said, go to Rome. I said, Rome for spirituality? Are you kidding me? This is about 1963 or 64. Well, wise guy, they said, where should you go? I said, I don't know, but I know not to go to Rome or to Spain. Let me write Thomas Merton. They thought I was utterly crazy. So I wrote Merton a letter. And a few days later, I got a letter back saying, go to Paris. So I brought the letter to them. Now I know where I have to go. I have to go to Paris. The answer to leak in Paris. No, they said, we never said he went to France or came home again. <laughs> and I said, so for months, I hit him over the head with Merton's letter. And finally, they relented. And they said, OK, you can go to Paris. And that's where I met my mentor, Pershineau, who named the Christian Christian for me. So I'll always be great to the, grateful to the Dominicans for sending me on and letting me go to Paris. And of course, I'm extremely grateful to Chanu for naming the Christian spiritual tradition and giving me what he gave me and the other professors at the Institute at that time were, were wonderful too. And, um, you know, I learned what I had to learn, what I really needed to learn, and the special relationship of culture and spirituality. And, um, and deep in my, it, it moves me the, the way you began talking about the, the Jewish uh, tradition, because um, when I did my master's thesis in theology, it was on Jesus' prayer in the New Testament because I realized this was when the Vatican Council going on, how important scripture was to influence our spirituality. And so much of Christian spiritual had been influenced by Neoplatonism and not by Jesus or Jewish thinking. And Jesus was a Jew. So the number one lesson I learned from that thesis, which I finished just before I left for Europe, is the role of culture. The Judaism is a culture. I mean, it's a, it's a language. It's got traditions. It's got, uh, of course, rituals and all the rest. And and then hitting France, and I hadn't had much French training at all. I had one year of French in college, but we didn't talk about it, and certainly not like like Parisians talk it. But uh, so just that shock of being in another culture and having to. What should I say? Uh, learn a new language and a new culture. And, and realize how relative one's own culture is. And of course, this is during the height of the Vietnam War, so that, that whole problem. I'm not, <laughs> I'd go to Vietnamese restaurants because they were the best buy in town. I was on a very small budget. And um, 
needless to say, I didn't want to advertise that I was an American. <laughs> what we were doing to their country. And I remember one place, I don't know if it was a Vietnamese restaurant, but someone asked me where I was from, and I said, Ireland. <laughs> because my father's Irish, and we'd go back far enough, someone, someone, something in me is from Ireland. But I didn't want to say, oh, I'm from America, and I'm so proud of my country's work. So all that, the relativity, and the impact of culture, really taught me so much. And uh, it, it was my perspective, and it was very strong, of course, in Chanu's teaching, too, about history. Chanu was an historian. And, um, and I spent my last months there on Basque Farm in southern France because I knew I couldn't get my thesis done in Paris because um, so many pe people I met at the university had been there for seven years and nine years because Paris has so many distractions that I want to get down and get out of here. So I rented a, a room on a Basque farm, a very small farm, a turkey farm in southern France. And I lived there for six months. It was one of the smartest things I've ever done. And I got my work done. And uh, But the Basque have their own culture intact. They've got their language. And I'd go to their mass on Sunday. It was in Basque. The sermon was in English. No, not in English, French. But um, yeah, one of the sermons one day was against American tourists, how they're destroying our culture. I, I was a little self-conscious at, at that time. But, um, and then I go to these, that have these dances every Saturday night, wonderful dances with big bowls made of paper mache that they would set on fire and everything. And, and then these other dances uh, where they had a man dressed up a special way would dance around a glass, just an ordinary glass with water in it, dance around, dance around, and then jump on top of the glass and not spill the water and then jump off and it would cheer. And uh, I don't just immersing yourself in a totally other culture that is kind of, um, you know, has kept its, its uh, authenticity. All that was part of my education. Uh, and to realize, to learn from the French how important art is. You know, you go to, to art galleries in France, and parents are there with their seven-year-old, 11-year-old kids, and, you know, there's no problem. The kids love it, and they're taking notes and drawing pictures. And, and I just realized, you know, art is so rare in America, you know. You don't see a lot of parents with kids in art museums. And, I mean, just that awakening to art, um, you know, really moved my soul. And, and I realized I used to write poetry when I was a kid. But from the time I hit teenage years, no more poetry. You know, it's, it, it isn't appropriate or something. And there was none, nothing like that in the seminary training. But here, my, the poet came back at me, too. So um, anyway, there's just so, there's so many gifts from all over the world in so many cultural forms and, and religious forms and expressions, expressions of religion. So all that was part of my awakening in, uh, in leaving this country and, um, and then returning um, you know, with, with new questions and new ways of living in the world. Sur la marge, as the French say, on the margin. <laughs> Let me ask, um, I want to make sure that I ask you the questions that I ask everyone around the world. Mm. And um, um, these are mainly personal experience. Um, but, uh, but I'm sure we'll have our fair share of theology. Huh. Um, the, the question I do ask people, which is meant to be an experiential question, not just uh, theological in the absence of experience, is what is your concept of God today? Hmm. Well, I recently wrote a book called Naming the Unnameable, 89 Wonderful and Useful Names for God, including the unnameable God. <laughs> so, so this is on my mind a lot. And a lot of the names I came up with come from science. For example, Names like energy and um, mind of the universe, which comes from um, 
Eric Jansch, an important physicist, who wrote a book called Self-Organizing Universe. And um, he's, in it, he says, God is the mind of the universe. And he says, now, now, mystics have been talking about this for centuries, but now that I'm writing about it as a scientist, more people will listen. <laughs> and he's right. You know, our culture, you know, wants to hear from scientists and rightly so. And uh, so anyway, uh, Flo is another, I, I met a young physicist, he was 41, and he was just ecstatic about the word flow. And this book on flow, written by this Czechoslovakian philosopher in Chicago, whose name I cannot pronounce, I'm sorry, but <laughs> very long name. And, um, but his thing was flow, that he thinks God is flow. Um, so, you know, I go through words like God is goodness, and God is love, and God is these things, flow and energy and so much more, justice. And, and of course, I, I find that a lot of these in the mystics, the mystics are naming divinity too. But then the, the last part of the, the list, the last eight or 10, are the apophatic divinity, God without a name, like my Eckhart says, God is uh, without, without a name, it will never have a name, and is unnameable, you see. And of course, this is part of mystical traditions too, that God has no name. We, we cannot name God. We can try, and that's not a bad thing. And of course, your very question is so important because we're living in a time when some of the familiar names of God are not working for people. And so that's why I wrote the book. It's a short book, but I think in a way, it's the most radical book I've ever written because um, um, if you can assist people to shake up rote uh, God talk, you know, God talk that we just kind of mumble because we heard it or we read it in our prayer services uh, and get down to the experiential, God is beauty is one of the names I really like. Um, everything can change. And, you know, the reason that many atheists are not really atheists, what they are rejecting is theism. And I rejected theism a long time ago. I could, I, what I perceive is panentheism, which means God in everything and everything in God, like the fish in the water, the water in the fish. That's the way mystics see divinity and our relationship to divinity. God is not out there. That's theism. And the whole idea from the modern era, the universe is a machine and God's out there like the oiling the machine or something. That's just not where it's at. So, um, you know, there's so many ways to talk about that, but just in terms of experience, that's where ecstasy comes in, I think, or, or these other names, presence or um, wanting, uh, or breakthrough. And those are just five or six wonderful names from mystics I believe in. I, I believe they, they act, acted their lives out on the basis of these things. Of course, God is compassion, which is Jewish and from Jesus too. Jesus was Jewish. When I wrote my book on compassion years ago, Spiritually Named Compassion, um, I learned so much. I learned that in the Jewish tradition, compassion is the secret name of God. And I just love that. But Jesus let the secret out of the day. He wasn't very good with, with keeping secrets. So Luke 6, be you compassionate as you create in heaven is compassion. And then you learn like what Thomas Merton did with compassion when he said the last talk he gave before he was murdered, he said, Compassion is a keen awareness of the interdependence of all living things that are all part of one another, belong to one another. But that word interdependence is so important today. It's the basis of today's physics. So this is where spirituality and, and science come together again. We can agree on interdependence. And of course, Thich Nhat Hanh invented the word interbeing. Hey, we're 90% there as a species. And interdependence demands justice because it's about justice is about homeostasis, it's about finding balance. So to say God is justice is to say that we're 
involved in trying to find balance in our search for divinity, both personal balance, but group balance, and ultimately species and earth balance. So I mean, there's just so many angles on divinity. And of course, William James says, you know, one of the signs of mysticism is ineffability, that you can't name what's happened to you. It's too big for words. Eckhart says the same thing. He says we we stammer and we stutter when we talk about God. So a little humility like that is so important. But here we have a culture where we stamp God's name on a coin and on dollar bills and on MX missiles for all I know, and certainly in presidential, sentimental presidential speeches. So we've, we've really abused the name God, hmm. which the Jewish tradition, of course, has tried to respect by saying, you know, you can't write it. And you shouldn't even pronounce it, except a couple of special days a year. But that has been totally, you know, swamped by the business of of God talk. So, um, you know, it's a big question you're you're asking. But um, those are a few thoughts about it. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Tell me about your growing up and your experiences of faith, whether that was faith or just religiosity or what. Tell me about those early memories. Well, um, I'm part of uh, seven children, um, 10 years apart, first and the oldest and the youngest. And um, obviously Catholic, <laughs> that happened to Catholic families back then. And, um, but my mother was not born Catholic. She was born Episcopalian and raised Episcopalian. And, uh, but she chose on her own to become Catholic after a year or two of marriage. And the kids started coming. She just felt it made more sense to have one, one faith tradition. But she always kept her, her freedom and uh, trusted her intuition. You know, she was criticizing Catholic Church a lot. And then when the guys, the Vatican Council came along, she'd say things like, see, I told you Latin isn't that important. I told you the rosary isn't that important. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and so she was a very independent thing. And my father was Irish Catholic and more conservative. He went to, uh, grew up in Chicago, very poor, uh, in the Irish ghetto. He remembers signs saying, during the Depression, saying, you know, jobs available, Irish do not apply. And he was very angry. And uh, he took his angry out in, anger out in sports. And he was a very good football player. So he got a scholarship to college from his football. He's the only one in his family who went to college. And um, I guess he had an uncle who became a, who was a dentist. But um, so football was kind of his salvation and, and because it it got him into college, I went to Villanova. That's where I met my mother in the East Coast. And, um, and then it was during the Depression in the 30s, and his coach, Harry Strudier, one of the four horsemen, he was a quarterback with Notre Dame back then. Um, he was a coach, and he got a job at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he told my father, when you graduate, come and join me. I want you to be my, my co a coach with me, an assistant coach. So that's brought my parents, and I think they had two kids then, um, to Madison, and that's where I grew up. And Madison is a state capital and a university town, but small, but very beautiful in terms of nature. It's five lakes and all this. So I grew up in a university town and in a capital town, so politics and, and university awareness was there. And my father at the, was at the university, at the university for, as coach for 10 years, but he made friends with a, a lot of, and my mother did, with a lot of um, professor types who were in other fields. And that was influential in my growing up. And um, um, the, one of the smartest things my parents ever did when I was in high school, we had a, a, a house with three floors and my Older brothers would go off to college, and we had an empty room up there. I was on the third floor, and they would rent it out to a foreign master student, graduate student. So I spent my adolescence uh, living next door to 
a communist from Yugoslavia, a fellow, a bull, ex bullfighter from South America who would, without even asking, would pull a shirt up when he first met you to show you where he got gored by a bull and he could brag about that. And um, with a Singh from India, um, who always wore his turban. And I remember when I was a senior, we had to give a, I was in a speech class in high school, and you had to give a, a talk on a, uh, some kind of, um, was it, they call it a performance or something like that. So make a long story short, he taught me how to tie the turban. So I went to class and I picked the most popular kid in class and put him in front on a chair and I tied the turban on and talked about it and what it meant to the sing people. And I got an A plus for it, you know. <laughs> but um, so I learned these, this is one of the smartest things that parents ever did. I learned that the whole world is not white, that it's not Christian. <laughs> And it's interesting, uh, one guy who was from Canada, he was sure there was gonna be a nuclear war, so he kept skis in his backyard. <laughs> I mean, no, not his backyard, in, in his car, in the trunk of his car. So he was gonna shoot off for Canada as soon as the bomb dropped and somehow make it to the North Pole or something, I don't know. But, you know, it just taught me to relax around cultural diversity and religious diversity. And I remember what, my freshman year of college, I brought a friend home with me, a college friend. And, you know, he, he just had a meal with my family. We had a big round table in our dining room. And, of course, one or two of our, our foreigners were there. And afterwards, he was just kind of like aghast. He couldn't believe it. He said, being at your house and being in the United Nations, he said, in the conversation what people are talking about. Right? Because I just figured this was what everyone grows up with, but of course it wasn't true. Um, and I went to a public high school and my friends were Jewish or Protestant or agnostic. And um, there were very few Catholics at school because there was a Catholic high school in town too, in that part of town. But um, I chose public high school because my older brothers and sisters had gone there. And um, we had wonderful debates about life and philosophical questions. So I would go to my Catholic priest who was Dominican and um, he'd give me books to read like Chesterton and Thomas Aquinas. And I thought that was really exciting that we, there's this intellectual tradition to my faith. And make a long story short, I attended a um, retreat my senior year at the Dominican House of Studies, which was in Dubuque, Iowa, where they're training Dominicans to be priests. And I was very moved. It was, it was a large place. I was moved by three things. One, the aesthetic of the chanting of the office, which is the chanting of the Psalms. It was in Latin then. But just the aesthetic of that moved me very deeply. It was a spiritual, mystical experience. But secondly, that they were studying, that they had an intellectual life. And, you know, I had conversations with them. They were bright people. They were alert. They were happy. And so community and, and um, the chanting and the Study. Oh yeah, the sense of community. I was from a big family, and and a, which included these diverse <laughs> guests in our home, and so um, I wanted community. I didn't want some kind of solitary kind of existence at that time. So uh, so I I decided my senior year that I'd give the Dominicans a try to see if I had a calling to do that. So that's what I did. I went to their the uh, undergraduate college, uh, Loris College in Abu, the Dominicans. If you were interested in them, they'd send you there for two years. It was like semi-training for them to see you and you to meet them. And I loved college, and there was intramural sports, and I loved sports. And... But um, a big part of my growing up was this, that when I was 12, I got polio. <clears throat> it was 1952, just before the, the next year they had the vaccine, <clears throat> but not my years, last year. Though. And a friend of mine had died of polio the year before at, at, at 10 years old. I was 11. But um, I lost my legs and my father, the football coach, my older brothers were all state football. And I, th I thought, well, that's what it means to be a man. I'm going to play football someday. And then I couldn't walk. <laughs> so, um, so that was interesting. That's what Chanu would call a rupture. And I was in the hospital for months. And they couldn't tell me if I'd walk again. But then I did get my legs back after about a year. And I remember saying to the universe, 
I'm never going to take my legs for granted again. And that to me is a mystical statement, not to take for granted. That's why so many mystical practices are about focusing on your breath. You know, we can take breath for granted every, every day of our life, every breath of our life. If you don't stop and, and listen and pay attention, the breath is pretty special. That's why it's a word for spirit and not only in the Bible, but around the world. So, um, and of course, in a real way, I left my father at 12 or 13 because he was a football coach and I looked like I wasn't be going that way. And uh, a lay brother, a Dominican brother would visit me regularly who was the opposite of my father. <laughs> he was, uh, my father was quite, um, I'll do the word for that. Um, uh, sort of slips into, but anyway, a sort of, and, um, and all that. This guy was very contemplative. And, you know, there was like a sweetness to him. And as it turned out, he ended up being a Trappist monk for many years, though, though then he left um, the Trappist order after like 30 years or so. But um, he was just, and I realized, oh, there are different ways of being a man. Yeah, this contemplative thing, that's interesting. And this guy's happy. He's at least as happy as my father. So, so when I got my legs back, I did go back to playing sports, but with much more detachment, I would say, than, than uh, my brothers or father had toward the whole thing. And, and I, you know, I, would, I got very interested in philosophy, and again, with the friends I made in high school, uh, and these kind of debates we'd have and all. And, and I loved high school. I loved the friendships. I loved sports. I loved the... Um, learning. I loved literature. I loved the English classics and writing. I loved to write. And I, I mean, I had mystical experiences reading Shakespeare. I had mystical experiences. I remember once I walked into the living room and I just remember it very vividly. And someone was playing Beethoven's Ninth. And it just hit me for the first time in my life. No, Beethoven's Seventh. Yeah, Seventh that night. I wanted to just dance, you know, just dance my life away. So it was an awakening. Beethoven was an awakening. Shakespeare was an awakening. And in my junior year, between junior and senior year summer, I read Told Stories, War and Peace. And it absolutely, I told a friend, it blew my soul wide open. And I wanted to explore what happened to me. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was important and special. It was a mystical experience, but I didn't have that language. And that's why I joined the Dominicans to explore what happened to me. And... Um, and uh, so all of that was my growing up. And, and again, I want to emphasize the nature thing. For example, I had Native American dreams when I was young, a lot of them. And um, the Native American spirit is very alive still on the land of Wisconsin. It certainly was back then. It still is today, I think. But that was important to me. And I also read a lot about the Holocaust. I, that was very meaningful to me, how people survived that like Viktor Frankl and so forth here and what it meant, what it meant about human beings that we could be so awful and yet so amazing. So that played a, a role definitely in my consciousness too. And I, I attended daily mass throughout high school. Um, I didn't tell anyone in school. I mean, my friends were not Catholic, but you know, I would hide it from anyone, but it meant a lot to me and I had a paper route for years. So I would, um, go that route and then I would stop in a mass and then I got the outside of church on Sundays and uh, they'd have like 10 masses on Sundays that you know back then people went, went to church a lot and um, there was a, a stand to sell newspapers and I thought wow that's much better than walking so far and one day a week instead of seven days a week and of course winter, the winters of Madison were for real um, so make long story short, I, I secured this, this, um, this um, uh, thing on wheels for selling newspapers and um, because the fellow wanted to move on. And uh, so I had that for the four years and, and I made money there, you know, the money that I later put to my college expenses. And um, but but I would, I'd go to mass very often on Sunday because especially when it was cold winter, you'd go in to get out of the cold. But I heard a lot of sermons and I heard, I learned how not to 
preach. <laughs> and I learned a few good sermons too. So, um, but I just love mass. I had a lot of mystical experiences at mass, especially Saturdays. And I didn't know why. Now I know why. Saturday in the Catholic Church back then was dedicated to Mary, which is, of course, the goddess. And they drew, they drew these wonderful readings from the, um, the wisdom passages in the Hebrew Bible. So, uh, Book of Proverbs, you know, I, uh, before creation, I was with God, the creator of the world, delighting to be the sons and daughters of the human race and so forth. In the book of Sirach, I walked the vault of the sky and the, and the sands of the ocean and all that. And this stuff really moved me. It was not part of what I was getting at school about what it means to be a man. That this was something new that really hit me in my heart. And uh, obviously, I can say it, it was the goddess. It was the feminine dimension. And the Catholic Church, to his credit, kept that alive, not really knowing what it was doing, to be honest, but at least it was there. And um, so that, that really hit me strong. And the whole mystery of the, of the Eucharist was very meaningful to me. And um, so anyway, so it was nature. And of course, it, in Madison, and my mother, you know, I, when it would rain or something, we'd be sitting around depressed or something. She'd say, she'd say things like, "No son or daughter of me is ever going to be bored. Get out, go to a museum, go to a movie, go canoeing." You say, "In the rain? Yes, in the rain." <laughs> but she she really encouraged us, and both of my parents were very athletic. Obviously, my father was a professional, and. Um, and my mother was a good swimmer, good, and she'd play tennis, and she had her own, had her own bicycle. And that's, so athletics was a big part of our, our growing up, and so you're outdoors. And back then, people didn't work out. I never heard of working out until a few decades ago. But, um, but you, you did these things outdoors. And so Madison was perfect that you had four distinct seasons, and there was tobacconing, and there was ice skating, and there was... Um, shoveling snow, making money in the winters. And there was mowing lawns in the summer. And there was raking leaves in the fall. And, uh, and uh, these lakes and, uh, you know, canoeing and, and rowboating, fishing and all this. So all of that experience in nature was beautiful and very mystical for me. I often would go walking in the woods and just get lost there. And, I, you know, it was a spiritual experience for me. Again, I didn't have language for it, but that hardly mattered. I knew it was important for me, and it kept me um, grounded. And, um, you know, that's how I was growing up. What would you say was the first time in your life you feel like you had to or chose to rely upon God as you understood God? that I had to rely on God. Or chose to. Or chose to rely on God. Well, I don't know. I guess it was kind of implicit in, in our family. I mean, we all went to Sunday Mass together and um, when we were young. And even when we traveled, of course, we would find a a church in wherever we were. And um, but I don't know that, that word rely on. I, I just I'm having trouble with that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess it was more like a, a way of living. We were very conscious, I think, that we were Catholic and that made us different. Because like in high school, there were very few Catholics in my high school. And, um, you know, topics would come up in class, often in, in literature class or something. You know, if it, there's, I remember once a, there's a line in Shakespeare about take you to a nunnery. And I, I objected to the word nunnery. I said, I, I know about convents. I know sisters. Because I did go to a few years of Catholic grade school. Not eight, but three or three or four. 
And I don't, you know, I felt that was a put down of, of sisters and not a very little argument about that. But, um, uh, so I guess, I don't know, it just kind of baked in that you relied on God and that you thank God for life and creation and everything and that there were some rules to follow. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, even when I'd probably, but I was young, 12 years old is young. But, you know, that, I wasn't afraid. And my mother told me that years later, she said, your father admired physical courage, you know, the sports and everything, but you taught him moral courage. Because when you got polio, he really freaked out because his father got polio and was in a wheelchair the rest of his life. He lost his living, which was repairing vacuum cleaners or something, and he started to drink. And I didn't know that about my father's background, but I never knew this about what my mother said. I was stunned with what she said. This was when I was in France. She came to visit me. She said, you've taught your father moral courage. So what do you mean? She said, when you got polio, you know, he really had to work himself up to go and tell you. And when he went and told you at polio, you said, oh, I know it. I heard someone on the phone two weeks ago talk about it. And your father just freaked out that you didn't freak out. <laughs> and I just, you know, when you're young like that, at least that was my experience, you don't, you don't worry about death that much. And you don't think about it. I don't know. You're too busy living, I guess. And um, so that was interesting. And it changed my relationship to my father for the good for the rest of our lives, really, because he was he was very critical of me when I was a child because I was small and skinny and and they didn't like that. And um, and I had this side to me that was more poetic, I think, than he was used to. But um, in high school, he, we never had one argument in all my years in high school. And, um, and when I told him I was going to well, actually, I told my mother I was thinking about becoming a priest, and then she told my father. And um, he was very moved by that. And it meant a lot to him coming from a Catholic church and a lot of Catholic schooling, because he went to a Catholic high school, Augustinians ran it in Chicago, St. Rita's. And then he went to Villanova, which is Augustinian College. And... Um, so it, it meant a lot to him, but I, you know, I didn't do it because of him. I just felt called to explore. And, um, but again, I'm not sure I can answer your question when I felt, uh, what was the word again? Uh, tell me about a time you feel like you had to had or to. chose to chose. rely upon God as you understand God. Well, I mean, You know, you call on God for help. You call on spirit when you're, when I'm writing, <laughs> when I'm doing my work, when I'm preparing for work. I'm sure I prayed when I was doing exams, <laughs> when I was undergoing exams as a young person and as a young Dominican. Um, Do you think this idea of relying on God is an old idea? Do you think it's inconsistent with creation spirituality? Like, is there any, is, is that a holdover from an externalized understanding of God rather than an internal or mystical understanding of God? Well, I guess I'm more at home with the term co-creation and that the Holy Spirit um, inspires us. Spirit inspires us. And um, I believe in angels, I've written a book on angels with a scientist, Rupert Sheldrake, um, that angels show up at times for intuition because intuition is what they're all about. They don't have to go to school. They don't have to write books <laughs> or read them. So um, I do think that the presence of spirits that, um, as Aquinas says, carry thoughts from prophet to prophet, like uh, my image is a bee carrying 
nectar from flower to flower. That to me is more reliance, is co-reliance, you know? So yeah, I guess I'm a little, um, a little um, uncomfortable with, with over, uh, with using that word reliance too much, but it may be just because I, I see a mutual thing going on between us and spirit. And um, sure, you want to call on spirit and um, for help and for guiding us and for keeping us steady, <laughs> grounded. Um, but spirit is always there. And uh, God is always here. So I think we can exaggerate the need for us to rely on God if we have this undercurrent of the presence. That's where the word presence comes in again. But I'm thinking right now, I have derived a lot of spiritual benefit from Native American practices. I've been blessed to have Native American teachers in my life. And Sundances, I'm thinking of one. The last one I attended, um, and they and I, I put on the skirt and, and the eagle whistle and so forth with the others, and um, and they said to me, the people who ran the dance said, uh, "Will you do this one thing you've never done before? We've never invited you to do it before." And what's that? I said, "Well, you know, in the middle of the ceremony, we have this. They have this. What they call the sacred tree in the center." Um, we want to bring you up there to um, say prayers of the tree. I said, fine, you know, come and get me when it's right. So um, the lead, the lead um, dancer um, who, who led the whole ceremony, he and his brother, um, he came and got me and brought me up to the, to the pole where, as I recall, you kneel and you kiss the pole, and then you, you say prayers. And I did that, and uh, so forth. And then you withdraw and go back to your place of dancing. And afterwards, so he said, he said, I've never met anyone who was so fast, <laughs> who was so swift in their prayers at the tree. And, uh, you know, he said, usually people spend more time there. And I just kind of smiled or something. I don't know what I said. But um, I don't know. Maybe I've just been doing this for so long. Uh, now, I wasn't in my 80s then. That would have been, I don't know, 10 years ago. I was in my 70s. Um, that I don't see that much of a gap between. And if you really believe in panentheism, there is no gap. Or as spirit as breath, which is the Genesis story, there's no gap. This is, the breath is in me. The breath of God is in me. That's what Yahweh means, I think. I'm told by Hebrew scholars no more than I do. Um, so once you really live with that over time, that um, some of these, the language is dualistic. And... Um, like the idea of relying on God as a dualistic it can, idea. It can be. Yeah. You know, I don't want to dismiss it, but, um, mm. you know, I call on God, like most people do when you're in a foxhole or something. Uh, but, um, but the presence is really interesting because I'm just getting into Shinu and it has begun to grow on me and dawn on me what, what a powerful naming that is, the presence. Hmm. If the presence is there all the time, we don't have to spend a lot of time uh, calling. No, it's more about being reminded. Being reminded. That's good. By Stryker, it says Christ is a great reminder. Hmm. <laughs> What about uh, times you've doubted 
your faith, times you've doubted presence and its existence. So probably my biggest doubts are about the church, which claims to be present, a presence, the mystical body of Christ, for example. And uh, of course, I've seen a good deal of the shadow side of that, of the organization. And, um, And so I've understandably, I think, sought presence beyond the confines of a self-identified organization or structure. And I think that's what deep ecumenism is. I think it's um, looking for divinity everywhere, as you say. And um, I can see it in my ancestors. I can see it in the, the struggle and the theological effort and often political effort to survive and to celebrate God and nature and to share it with other generations and so forth. But again, I've experienced it in sweat lodges. I've experienced it in Sundance. I've experienced it in vision quests, um, presence of the divine. So I don't find it just at mass or, um, or from the Catholic church. Um, and of course, I, I ended up joining the Episcopal Church because young people invited me to, because they were reinventing forms of worship, bringing rave into liturgy. And I just felt, and I'd just written a book, the Reinvention of Work, the last chapter being on reinventing ritual, and how important ritual is. And I, there were six elements I said to reinvent it. One is the body. You've got to bring the body back. You've got to bring silence back. You've got to bring grieving back and so forth, and these people were doing that. And so I said, how can I help them? They said, well, if you were in this place, you could run interference for us. These people in Sheffield, England, young people in their 20s and younger. And I thought and prayed about it. I said, well, the Pope fired me. He doesn't need me. He's told me he doesn't need me. Furthermore, the Catholic Church under these popes, that was during the next time, there's going to be no creativity in liturgy, but these young people, a new generation, a new era of postmodern young people with new art forms like DG and VJ and rap, they deserve, you know, worship experiences. And I, I can help. They tell me I can help. They said, we're, we're following your theology of the cause of Christ, but if you were with us, you could run interference because you get what we're doing, and most priests and theologians don't. So that's when I went to Bishop Sweeney, the Episcopal Bishop in San Francisco, and said, here, I'm, I think I've become Episcopal Priest, but only for one reason, to work with young people to reinvent forms of worship. He said, go for it. We're not doing anything for young people. And, um, and we talked for a while, and then I said, well, I have one question for you. Will you protect me from your right wing? Because I've just had a 12-year ordeal with the Vatican, and I'm not going through that again I'm for the sake of religion. He said, I'll tell you a story. I began my priesthood in West Virginia, and it was during the Civil Rights Movement. And I took on the head of the uh, coal companies around civil rights. He said, I'm a fighter. I'm a street fighter. I may not read any of your books, but I'll protect you from the right wing. And I said, we can do business together. And I shook hands. And he was good. And you're right. He, he was absolutely there. Uh, when we had a, um, um, we, I talked um, Anita Roddick into putting up money to bring over 30 of these young Englanders, the Anglican Church in England, who brought Rave into the church there, and um, with their equipment to Grace Cathedral, to a, what they call a planetary mass in the basement, the gymnasium. And um, uh, let's see now what part of the story was I talking about. Um, oh, yeah. When parishioners heard about it at Grace Cathedral, um, 
there was objections. And Bishop Swing wrote in the Episcopal newsletter, the, the, I remember the title of the article was, Let Them Rave for God's Sake. <laughs> And he went on and said, people are bitching because the young are being invited into church to rave and pray and new forms of worship. He said, um, "We, for years, uh, young people have been leaving the church and I've never gotten a letter objecting. <laughs> now that we're doing something for them, the letters are coming in. So let them rave for God's sake, which was, you know, what he promised me he'd do. He stood up to the murmurantes those who murmur mm -hmm. and uh that's just one example you know so um but it sounds like what you're saying is that if you had any loss of faith it was in the church during the years of being silenced um or pushed out is that right or what, what do you well no i mean these the whole thing about the pedophile priest crisis of course that happened after i left um Though I never really formally left the Catholic Church. When I became Episcopal, they didn't sign a, sign a paper, I'm out of here. No, I just, I, I invoked the teaching of a sociologist at UC Berkeley who wrote in his book on postmodernism that he says, we belong, all of us today belong to many, so many um, communities at once that we should write ETC period after our names. So I've never really left the Catholic Church. I just moved over in a rather Aikido move. Um, they came after me and I just kind of moved over and joined the Episcopalians. But um, so I do belong, I, you know, I don't think I'm not Catholic. I think my theology is very Catholic and what I do. But, um, but I'm within the Episcopal Church now, which is fine with me, but it's both and. What exactly or the what, what was the experience of your writings being reacted to by the Vatican? What what is that story from a personal experience point of view? Well, I never took it personally. I always knew it was political because they silenced three Catholic theologians the same year: myself. North America, the Leonardo Buff in South America, and Eugene Drewerman in Germany. Now, what did we have in common? Each of us was the most read Catholic theologian in our country or our continent. And um, so obviously that's a political move. They were going to shoot down these three people, public people, theologians, to send a message to all other theologians to get in line. You know, they're serious about controlling things. And they were reacting mainly to what, the Cosmic Christ idea? Well, actually, I wrote, uh, the Cosmic Christ book came out right at the time when I went into formal silence. So they had not read it yet. <laughs> no, they were reacting with me to my original blessing book. Mm. That was the one that blew the roof off the Vatican. Mm. But I already published about, that came out in 83. But I'd probably published, I don't know, seven books before that, including a major one, The Stick on Meister Eckhart, and um, the book on compassion, the book on prayer, called I'm Becoming a Musical Mystical Bear, Spiritual American Style, and a book called Western Spirituality, which I edited and invited other reader, writers to be in, though I wrote a couple articles in it. And what, other, what else came out before Original Blessing? We would be all the way home. So, um, see, they st started out with an investigation of three of my books, Original Blessing, We We All the Way Home. Oh, no, not Original Blessing. No, that that was before. No, now I'm getting confused. Maybe it was Original Blessing and We We We. But three Dominicans, two of them were very conservative, wrote to Rome afterwards. It took him six months to read the books, but there's nothing, this isn't heretical, this is in our tradition. Six months later, Rome wrote back and said, yes, it is, do it again. They wrote back and said, no, we won't do it again. So there's like the standoff for years, but the Vatican kept pushing, pushing, pushing. And um, 
but it was original blessing that blew the roof off the Vatican. And, and so my response was, first of all, they really feel threatened by this. <laughs> this is really an issue for them. And then I realized how invested patriarchy is in original sin. It's just a great way to keep people un under the thumb. <laughs> and, uh, but as I learned from Jewish students of mine way back at Barra College, Jesus never heard of original sin because no Jews ever heard of original sin. It was Augustine, fourth century. See, I didn't know this. One day in class at Barra College, that was my first job teaching, almost, and uh, a 42 year old. Jewish woman was in class, very bright, a close friend of Rabbi Heschel. She worked with him a lot in Chicago. She introduced me to Rabbi Heschel, by the way, for which I'll always be grateful. But she came up to me after class. She said, what's this thing they're talking about in class, original sin? Here's a Catholic guy. I said, well, it's about the fall. You the story about the fall. Well, yeah, we had the fall, but I've never heard a rabbi or any other Jew talk about original sin. So it blew my mind. I mean, it was an awakening moment for me. Does you fall an original sin? And then, of course, I started to research it. Augustine, fourth century, first person to use the term. And here the Catholic Church had invested so heavily in it for 16 centuries since. What's this about? It's about running an empire. You can run an empire, original sin's a great idea. Get them to line up and go kill in the name of Jesus. Boy, you get you got them covered. So that's what I learned, is how over they overreacted. Because also, I was careful in my book. I did not deny original sin entirely. I just said, the Bible is about original blessing, first of all. Check Genesis 1. And um, if you begin to sin, you're beginning with the human. And there's a lot of creation before the human came along. It had nothing to do with sin. And furthermore, it's not in there because Jews wrote the book and they don't believe it. They don't have it in there. This was made up at the in the century, the fourth century, when it got, when the church inherited the empire, and Augustine created an imperial theology. But they so overreacted because they said I denied original sin. But I was careful, and I didn't. And he, my provincial, who was a theologian of sort, he had published some books, a few, one. <laughs> Anyway, he, he defended me. He wrote back and he said, you know, he said in Teilhard, I suppose, blah, blah, blah. he defended me for several years, but then the pressure was so great that he began to wilt under the pressure after 10 years. And all this time they were trying to shut down my program at Holy Names College, which was very ecumenical. We had Yoruba priests, they didn't know about the Yoruba priestess. <laughs> they them they taught African dance, but they, they knew about Starhawk, who was a Wicca, and a wonderful prophetic Jewish woman who's, um, who's always stood for the prophetic. But, um, but they, um, and I had Native American, oh yeah, they complained about that. That was part of, you know, there was a, a list of seven things, and one of them was our work too closely with Native Americans. I think what they meant was he put up a sweat lodge on the campus, Catholic campus. I don't think there's anything like that anywhere in the world. And we would have wonderful sweats, the faculty, the staff, students, all of them together. I remember one time we were stripping down to go in the sweat lodge, and, and this one faculty member who's Jewish, he, he was a scientist, and he, he would lead people to artist meditation by going into nature. And, you know, getting people to listen and observe more carefully, you know, all the bushes and everything that's there. But we were stripping down to go on this way. He said to me one day, he said, I must be the only Jew in the world that's stripping down on a Catholic campus to go in and have a sweat lodge with a Lakota man. I said, yeah, I think you could bet on that. <laughs> but anyway, um, I don't remember. So, it's, uh, so at some point... Um, you said you were silenced, or you were oh, asked not oh, yeah. to speak oh, no, no, Polish, I, or? Yeah, I was silenced for a year. And what does that mean? No teaching, no lecturing, no preaching, and no publishing. And did you follow that at the time? I did. Um, it wasn't an easy decision to make, but my master general, the head guy in Rome, head of the Dominicans, and my provincial said, oh, do it, it'll make it easier for us, and all this, and do it. Now, the same year, they silenced Leonardo Boff, Franciscan in Brazil, the Liberation theologian. 
And they silenced him first, so I kind of observed what how he handled it. Now, he had a cardinal on his side, Cardinal Arns in Brazil, who was a wonderful man. I visited him. The year it went silent, I spent, it was the only sabbatical I've ever had in my life. Not that they paid for it, but I got someone else, a philanthropist, to hold me up financially for a year. But I went to South America. I spent time with Leonardo Boff. But also Cardinal Arns, I spent, I had a whole 50 minutes with him alone. He spoke perfect English. And he was really honest with me about Pope. This is during Pope uh, John Paul II's time. He told me things, including the fact that the German mafia were running the Vatican. But anyway, um, Andy Silas Druerman in Germany at the center. Druerman was a priest, but a psychologist. And his books were very important to people. You know, working with good psychology and the Gospels would kind of look what he would do. So we were all silenced the same year. And of course, obvious, this is a political act. You know, it's not because they know me and they think I'm, you know. And this is Ratzinger under John Paul II. Exactly, Ratzinger. You know, John Paul II brought the Inquisition back. There's no question about it. And Ratzinger was his hatchet man. And he loved it. So I was silenced for a year, and then they they didn't tell me I was unsilenced. And I waited another month, and I waited another month. So really, it was fourteen months. And finally, I went to my provision. So what is this? Well, he said, just start talking, you know. But because they had told me that Rome would tell me conducting it, but that was it. So the first public event I gave after my 14 months of silence was a big event in America. It was in Chicago called the Action, which is progressive Catholic. There were like 2,000 people. It was a conference, but I was one of the main speakers. And so I had, in a dream, dreamed, uh, it told me what to say. My opening line was, um, as I was saying 14 months ago, when I was so rudely interrupted, now, I thought I'd get a laugh, but I got two laughs. And the, the first phrase was a laugh, and they just roared, it went on. And then I had to repeat the first part to get to the second part when I was so rudely written, and the whole place just erupted. And like the National Catholic Report did an article on it. And they spent the whole time in that one thing. They didn't talk about anything else I said in my talk. But it was a special moment. I, I don't regret it. But I heard later that it really flipped the Vatican off again because you know inquisitors don't have real good senses of humor that's where where they're lacking and um so that kept them on my trail they were not pleased with that and within three years i was expelled from the order and um after 34 years and uh yeah so so um and what, what was that experience of being expelled like? Being expelled? Um, well, first of all, I was surprised. I was naive. And um, because I had just written a book on Thomas Aquinas, and no one wrote books on Aquinas after the Second Vatican Council, it seemed, because he was kind of not in favor at the council. But um, instead, they were going for biblical studies and ecumenism and all this stuff. But I, I created a different way of teaching Aquinas and dealing with him because I tried to teach him over the years and I realized the young minds cannot wrap their minds, get into a scholastic view of the world. And I, I would, I had almost given up. Is there any way to bring Aquinas into our times? Cause he had a lot to say. And, um, for example, on science and religion and all good stuff. And then I, I came up with this idea after the apple was invented, that I could interview him, and each sentence could have a, would be from him. But I could ask a question like, what are the relationship between matter and spirit, body and soul? And I could draw a sentence from his commentary on Isaiah, and a sentence from his Summa Theologica, and a sentence from his Conte Gentes. You have a very interesting paragraph. And because of the app or computer, each sentence is footnoted, you see. And, um, and it works. And um, so that's what I do. It's, it's a big, thick book, but I, I think it brings Aquinas alive again. And because I de-scholasticize him. 
And I, I pose questions that are important to people today. And of course, I divide it by the four paths. And um, so I just finished that book and I said, they're not going to kick me out now here. This is a major work on Aquinas. And, it's, and I translated works that had never been in English before. A lot of them. I didn't realize how many of the books had never been translated into English or German or Italian. I thought they'd be pleased. So that's how naive I was. But the, ring, the doorbell rang one day, and there was this pink slip from the Vatican uh, delivered by, I think it was... Um, um, well, it was one of these delivery systems. And, you know, saying that I'm I'm out of the order and uh, to never wear the habit again. Well, I'd already given the habit away to a Jewish friend of mine who was a an actor. And I'd written a play on my strike card and he, he had worn the habit and he wanted to keep it, I guess. And I did never use for it. I never wore it those years. So anyway, uh, anyway, I remember. But I sat down on my steps with this dismissal missive in my hands. And I said, what's the meaning of this? And then a, a word came I'd never heard before, saying, you are a post-denominational priest. I said, well, that's interesting. And uh, so that was the title of my autobiography that I wrote the next year or so, called uh, Confessions of Making of a Post-denominational Priest. And then, and then it was a couple of years later that I ran into the Anglican youth who came to a conference of mine in Seattle, five of them, and told me about what they were doing. And, and of course, I was re writing the book, Reimensional Work, when I was fired, too, which is kind of synchronistic. <clears throat> but um, how did it feel? Well, first thing, is I was surprised. And I... And, um, Secondly, I was sorry. I felt sad because I had given 34 uh, years, good years, uh, to this community. So that was a community. And I enjoyed them, and I thought they enjoyed me. I, I mean, there were times in the past when my provincials would praise me for my work and things like that. But um, their, their pitch was, well, I called in a canon lawyer when things were getting really hot. And I gave him the documents from Rome to my provincial, and then from then to me, to study and tell me, you know, and he had worked in Rome, he knew Rome well, and he was working in San Francisco, Dice at the time. And he sat me down, and I had a little team with me in my, in my living room, and he said, um, Well, he said, you are in the sights of Ratzinger. He will not let go. He will do everything he can to destroy you. And this is what he will do. He will eventually give your provincial, or your master general, any provincial, an order that you cannot in conscience obey. Then they will kick you out for disobedience, because we take a vow of obedience, and his hands will look clean. But that's exactly what happened, because the order they gave me eventually was to quit my work in Oakland, in my school, the Institute of Culture and Priest, but General Williams College, which had been going for nine years then, and went on for another three, <clears throat> and returned to Chicago, and um, which was is the headquarters of where our province was. And that's what happened eventually, that I could not, in conscience, destroy this amazing school we had. But we had physicists and cosmologists, we had people of all traditions, and uh, activists, Sister Dorothy Stang, who came to study with us, who ended up dying as a martyr in the Amazon. Wonderful people, wonderful students, wonderful faculty. We had Jeremy Taylor, a great Jungian ther um, therapist who taught dreams as meditation, one of the best dream teachers, and he wrote a lot about it too. And I mean, just had wonderful things happening. And um, and they they wanted me to abandon it. And also I had amazing, Great Spirituality Magazine, which had been running for like 10 years, 
Oh, no. And it would have killed that, too. And um, just recently, Brian Swim, who was on our park in the cosmology, said to me, Matt, what would have happened if you'd come back to Chicago? You realize, you realize every book you've written since, and the Cosmic Mass, and the Order of the Sacred Earth, I mean, every, and then the university you founded, because I did get kicked out of my of holy names eventually. None of that would have happened. <laughs> he said, it's good you didn't go back. Yeah, I think it is a good decision. So, um, I felt bad, you know, but again, it's kind of like a divorce, I guess, you know, that you regret it and it comes up sometime. What if, you know, I sometimes ask, what if the order had sent, instead of being afraid of me, well, you see another thing that happened is the Dutch Dominicans offered me asylum. They said this, we, you can join our province and still work in California and then come in the summers to be with us in Europe. And you can work in Europe. You're Europeans want your work. There's been a lot of translations of your books here. I said, wow, what a marvelous solution. And I went to my provincial and said, this is a win, win, win. You guys get out from under the pressure from Ratzinger and Rome. And um, I remain a Dominican and do my work. And the Dutch are, and see, the Dutch said, you know, We've been in business 750 years. We know how to protect theologians. And they were protecting Father Skilovic, who was a very renowned Dutch Dominican theologian. And I knew him. I had visited there, his priory several a number of times. And he's and they said to me, you know, you Americans, Dominicans, don't know how to protect theologians. We do. We've been doing it for 700 years. And they sent a formal. They had everyone in their provincial council sign this letter saying, we, we accept Matt Fox. But the rules are the province you're leaving has to approve, you know, say, okay, take them. But when I said that to my provincial, who was 10, at least 10 years younger than me in the order, he slammed his fist on the table and said, I don't want you in any province in the world. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that. Wow. Yeah. So I felt badly, but, um, do you, you know, always a vocation is a vocation. It's morning. Right. A calling to be a Dominican is a calling to carry on that work. And I think I've been doing that. Rem Zalman said to me he had to be pushed out of the nest <laughs> to do the work that he oh. came to do. Do you feel that similar for you? Oh, is that Reb Reb was talking about himself. Yeah, oh, good. I remember he and Shlomo Karbach were both Chabad, were both Lubavitch oh. Chassids. Uh -huh. And uh, oh. Reb Zalman got kicked out They're, for writing uh, about using LSD for spiritual oh. experiences. Um, I remember as a memorial service, his wife was next to me. And there was a video showing, and he's in the hot tub preaching. He poked me. My ribs are really sore at the end of that whole thing. But she poked me and said he was on LSD at the time. Have you read his books, his pamphlets on LSD? <laughs> that was all new to me. But um, I'll tell you one, Sat Satish Kumar, by the way, you should interview him for your book. Such an interesting guy. He's, he was a Jain monk in India. He grew up there. And he left in his mid-20s or so. And he walked to all the capitals where uh, the country owns nuclear weapons, walked with no money. He walked from India to Moscow, <laughs> to London, to Paris, and to Washington. Not on the water, but, <laughs> and I mean, an amazing guy. And then he started Schumacher College in England, where he's been since. And he had a magazine called Resurgence, which is a fine magazine. But he said to me one day, he said, after, of this, he said to me, you know, he said, your Dominican brothers must have loved you very much unconsciously. I said, what do you mean? He said, by expelling you so publicly, they told the whole world about your work and about creation spirituality. <laughs> we wouldn't have known if they had not done that to you. So I think there's, that's kind of an interesting perspective. <laughs> Just to close the loop on the original question, um, it sounds like the disappointment and the separation was with the church, but in terms of presence, um, feeling, having a sense of the presence in your life, that, um, that has been consistent for that you? That didn't lessen, yeah. Um, 
in many ways, that expulsion was rupture, to use Chanute's word. I mean, it was real rupture. I mean, I devoted, you know, I wasn't just in the order 34 years, but as a teenager, I was yearning to be in the order. So I mean, I was living that. Because see, my, my parish was a Dominican parish, so I, I was very close to the brother. And of course, I spoke to priests there about coming one and brothers too, the lay brothers. So it, it was in my bones. And I mean, I was baptized there and everything else. So, you know, it was that kind of rupture. But, um, but God is not Catholic, <laughs> nor is God Jewish. <laughs> and spirit is not Catholic or Jewish. So, and the Anglicans, you know, uh, the Episcopalians, I'll call them. You know, I've been, I'm grateful that they offer me religious asylum. Mm. It would have been easier for me to ta take an asylum from the Dominicans and stayed in the Catholic Church like that. But being outside, you know, I've learned a lot of things. I didn't, a lot of things about our community. You know, what I've been exposed to, all the things I've been exposed to since, um, no, I don't think I would have. And um, and I've, I've kind of been forced to live more ecumenism than I would have lived, I think, and see the world from the other side. So a lot of, you know, gifts has come, have come out of it. And so I, I don't really pass judgment on it so much. The biggest disappointment for me was what I would call lack of courage on the part of the Dominicans, because I see courage as being one of the real tests. Jesus talks about, by their fruits you'll know them, I think the two fruits of spirituality in our time that I know are reliable are joy and courage. Mm -hmm. And if either is missing, and especially the courage is missing, people aren't living spiritual lives. I don't think your life is deep if you don't have courage. And courage sometimes means standing up to institutions and forces and powers that are acting badly. And... Um, this was a power that was condemning liberation theology. It was in bed with the CIA, literally, I've written a book about this, uh, Pope John Paul II and Ratzinger out to destroy these communities and liberation theology in South America. And look what's happened as a result. And they have Opus Dei, either supporting Opus Dei, which is pure fascist including in North America, etc. So, I mean, horrible things have happened. And then the Supreme Court we're dealing with, you know, they all come out of that Opus Dei, fascist, Catholic um, manipulation. And now we have the name and everything. This guy, Leo Leopold, is, um, is an Opus Dei member out of the closet. Most of them are in the closet who's with Heritage Foundation and delivered to McConnell each one of these radical right-wing um, Catholics to the Supreme Court when, when they were wanted. So, uh, you know, this has tremendous implications on history and on the body politic. And uh, I, I'm disappointed that more Catholics have not spoken up about this. A number have the call to action people, but very few bishops, very few provincials, master generals, you know, they've been hiding. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm at peace with the decisions I've made personally and publicly around the, the main ones I've made. I don't mean I haven't made mistakes, but um, it's, it's sad to see so little courage at this time in history when it's really needed. But I think it's all part of, in my book on the, that records the history of, of the church in, in my generation, what's it called, the Pope's War, the, um, was it the Pope's War, Ratzinger's Crusade, and what's how, how Reisinger's crusade destroyed the church and what remaining or something like that. I don't remember the subject, but um, 
in that book I end, the last chapter is on how the Holy Spirit is destroying the Catholic Church as we know it through three, two bad popes for 34 years. It's the Holy Spirit's work to free Christianity to get back more swiftly to the Jesus message and be more ecumenical and all the rest. So good things can come out of this thing. And, you know, you have to look at the statistics. I mean, a few years ago, the Diocese of Manhattan spent its time closing 100 churches. And, you know, the few number of, of priests and so forth. And, um, you know, you, you just it's been 2,000 years, the age of Pisces. You had this thing called Christendom or Christianity, as we know it. Now we need a whole new thing. Mm. And I've tried to, I think, lay out some of the elements of it in the Catholic Christ book and elsewhere. And um, and the young, and so many of the young are just uh, not even looking to the church for spirituality anymore. So clearly, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a future for spirituality. There's a future for work to save Mother Earth. And that requires recovering the sacredness of Mother Earth. So spirituality is an integral part of human survival uh, as a species, <clears throat> and a verse survival as we know it. But we all have to loosen up and we have to take the essence of our, our wisdom traditions and gather it together with science and get the job done. So we don't need these uh, big institutional religious um, forms anymore. Yeah. You know, um, I love what you said about courage. And I think it takes a certain courage to talk about pulling out of religion and returning, well, pulling out of religion what is still potent and pulling in the mystical again. And in some ways that takes courage, I think, compared to just ditching religion or mm. saying mm. enough of that, yeah. it didn't work. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's true. Um, it takes courage, it takes certain clarity too. They can distinguish between religion and spirituality and between church and kingdom of God. <laughs> the right. difference. Um, so it takes some clarity. You know, there's got to be some intellectual life to all this too, I think, really. And that's where I've been blessed, I think, to have some wonderful teachers in my life, like Parish Anu, but others along the way. And my generation and the Vatican Council was a, played its role. Um, but as, as even Chanu says, it's, how do you put it, it's, it's worked its way out now. You know, I just, I, and I see this Pope Francis, who I think has a, a decent view of the world and all this. He certainly makes mistakes, but he's done some good things. Laudate Si, by the way, Laudate Si probably wouldn't have been written if I had left my school because it was written by one of my students. 80% uh, of it, yeah, it was written by Sean McDonough, who is an Irish priest who is a missionary in the Philippines. And uh, he, went through our program, master's program, and then went back and wrote a series of short books on spirituality and ecology, which Pope Francis obviously learned about, and he called him to Rome to write the sick book. So that's something I say, two popes called my work dangerous and deviant, which they did. And the third one is plagiarizing my work. And it's all over, but I see it, it's all over. The Christ is everywhere in Laudate Si. So that's kind of nice. I say I've lived a full circle of a life. <laughs>
Rupert Sheldrake and, and so many others. Um, I'm grateful to be living at this unique time, which really is a time of passage. Um, and that I've had the many opportunities and the good health, because that's part of being silenced and expelled and all that too, is, you know, there have been many priests in my generation who died of heart attacks because they were silenced and or lost their living because they were silenced. And because, um, you know, it's a big scarlet X on your forehead, you know, within the Catholic Church. I mean, I'll tell you one story, maybe a couple of stories, at least one of them. One person who's a Catholic was telling me that after I was condemned or whatever they did to me, that he one day saw a van drive up to their church library and take out all my books that were in the church library. Oh, yeah. And this was happening in every Catholic church in, in the United States. And also Catholic bookstores. I don't even know if there are Catholic bookstores anymore, frankly. I don't think there are. There are probably Catholic shops where they sell rosaries, but read books, I don't know that there are. But um, so, you know, it really, it really um, affects your, you know, what can I say? You're getting the word out, you know, to have this kind of scarlet letter on you. Now, it's true my audience grew with the non-Catholic, but the Catholics just kind of freaked out on it, you know. At least a number did, and not, not all those who were, um, you know, that call to action, which is your progressive Catholics, they've stayed in touch and stuff. But, you know, there are these side effects. So the point is that, that like, there was a, a fine French theologian who was silenced in all this, and he was last seen driving a taxi in Paris, you know. So, I mean, once, when you work, you know, your lifetime to study and be, you know, adept at your work, such as a theologian, and have that ripped away from you. And of course, you can't get jobs in, in Catholic school and stuff. Um, you know, you, you one pays a real price. And um, But I've been blessed that I've been able to find work and beyond uh, any particular um, denomination. And of course, I started my own university when I was, when they kicked me out of Holy Names. And 95% of my faculty came with me. And so we had a beautiful nine years, a strong nine years, and we started our doctoral program and really, really reinvented what uh, theological education can be because we had a doctor ministry in work. And my whole thesis was that Luther talked about the priesthood of all believers. I talked about the priesthood of all workers. There are people doing good work in the world, they're priests, because archetypally a priest, I define as a midwife of grace. So this book of yours and what you're doing, you're a midwife of grace. Mm -hmm. And um, our good work and whatever it is, you could be a therapist, you could be a carpenter, you could be a mechanic, repairing people's car engines, you can be a cook. Uh, Everything has a spiritual, sacred dimension, if it's good work. You know, if you're just in there to make money, like Rupert Murdoch is, that's something else. But um, so the dignity of work, you know, is is where most people, so that's in my book, I mentioned work, most people leave their footprint and their gift to the world through their work. And that's a beautiful thing, it should be honored and it is in the, in the most raw sense of the archetype of the priesthood. It's, it's that's where midwife of creation, that's where midwifing is going on. And um, so even that is part of the gift that I've been given, the blessings that I've had, that I can write about these things and talk about them and meet with all kinds of workers and work, work with all kinds of workers and uh, try to articulate just a little of the wisdom that they've uh, extended to me. What's your greatest wish? My greatest wish, <laughs> that human beings would wake up, would grow up, would first of all be grateful for 
existence for these 13.8 billion years that have brought us here so that we would give thanks, blessing, return blessing for blessing, and that we'd reinvent education, politics, economics, religion, media, the art, and everything else to carry on this amazing species that we are um, and get it tuned to the earth and her needs. And that means all the creatures on the earth and tuned to our real needs, which are inner needs. You know, Thomas Merton has this amazing passage where, you know, he was alive when we were aiming for the moon, but he died before he got there. But he, he was the only one I know that was a naysayer. And he was a naysayer because he has this wonderful passage. I could get it for you. It's in my book on Merton. Or I can just paraphrase it. But he said, <clears throat> he said, what, what good is it? So what good is it if humans can fly? Even ants fly. They're flying ants, he said. And um, sailing to the moon, what good is it going to be? do? And we, we're just going to take our, our troubles to Venus and to Mars, he said. The, mo the most important discovery is the inner discovery, and it's much harder than getting to the moon and back. And this is what we have to do first. We have to find out who we are, because otherwise we'll take our violence and our projections and all the rest to some other, colonize some other planet. So, I mean, and that he resisted the entire ethos of the 60s, late 60s, where everyone was all charged up to get to the moon, uh, to say these things. I think it's, it's really powerful and, um, uh, and really important that that's, uh, that's what I want. I want humanity to deal with humanity. And, and, uh, you know, we have a lot going for us. We have psychology and we have cosmology. And I think our civilization totally underestimates the spiritual dimension to this new scientific find, to the Webb telescope, for example. You know, that beauty can change people and shake you up. And when you know what a miracle it is, and the word miracle, as you know, is new, comes to the word for marvel. So the marvel that we're here on this amazing, tiny, tiny planet. Um, and, you know, I want to believe there are other planets that have intelligent life on it, but I'm not naive about that. When I read about what, what had it happen on Earth for life to happen and then for intelligent life to happen, and there's so many needles that, we, that were threaded I, I'm not convinced. I want there to be other planets where there's this intelligent life, but I'm not convinced we're going to find them. I mean, and if we don't, that's just really interesting. But even if we don't, we know they're awfully far away. And um, why don't we just do this one smart thing and take care of our own planet and our own species? And that has to include inner work. And that's where the, the mystical traditions and psychology and those who deal with shadow, which is psychology, you know, with our, our obvious, you know, I'm about to write tomorrow in my daily meditations, so an insight I've had the last few days. That original sin is the chimpanzee inside of us. We're 99% the same DNA as a chimpanzee. But I was talking with Brian Stroom the other day, and I wrote about this, maybe it's for tomorrow's daily meditation. But he said, think of a stadium with 50,000 people in it, you know, cheering and all that. Now put 50,000 chimpanzees into the same stadium. They will go to war with each other. Chimpanzees can only get along with their small tribe. They're tri utterly tribal. They, but we have broken out of tribalism at times. <laughs> and so we can sit with 50,000 others, 100,000 others, and cheer, and, and still, you know, be at each other's throats because your team may not be my team and all the rest. But th we are unique, as he says, as a species. And our absolutely closest cousin
cousin is a chimpanzee, and they would be just warring with each other. And of course, when chimpanzees go to war, they eat fingers, they eat genitals. I mean, you know, it's all out with chimpanzees. And of course, we see this in us too. You know, the chimpanzee comes through in our wars and everything and in our public politics. Have you read uh, Harari Sapiens? Um, I don't know if I've read that, but I read this wonderful book this year on, on, that has chimpanzees, whales, and uh, these special parrots from South America. Uh, I don't remember the name of it now, but it's really good. Harari's, but, Harari's theory yeah. is that uh, his central question is, how did Homo sapiens beat out Neanderthals? Oh, And his oh. hypothesis is that, um, and they know from ape studies, that the collective can only get up about to 50, and then a new alpha emerges. And so his theory is that Homo sapiens developed the capacity for mythologies, mythologies that would cause the stadium yeah. to not eat uh -huh. each other. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. And the, yeah. That in that way, even though Neanderthals were stronger, Homo sapiens were able to gather massive groups under a mythology. Wow. That's beautiful. I got to read that because I've heard about the book, but I haven't gotten to it. Thank you for telling me that. I'll definitely go get the book. Well, I mean, it makes sense. And that, of course, is, is religions. It is, but it takes and out art. And, and a lot of in a way, that's how you condone psychology being devoid of mystery. Because <laughs> you could say, oh, well, then give me a method. We're the people who believe in the duck god. We're the people who live by the river. Yeah. We're the people with blue eyes. <laughs> um, and I want to believe that there is a mystery and a sacredness beyond that, yeah. beyond the mythology. Definitely. So I've heard another theory, which I like a lot, about why we outdid the Neanderthals. And it's this, that um, the research they've done, uh, my understanding, and it was a woman anthropologist who led this research, had a team, of course, is that Neanderthals only lived to be about 40 or 42 as a rule. They had no grandparents. That Homo sapiens lived longer, so we had three generations. And this to me really rings true, they had elders. Because indigenous peoples who have the longest memory, you know, eldership is so important to them. And I think they remember that it was the grandparents that got them through through life. So I mean, both things That's to be beautiful. true. It is beautiful. And it's very important to old people to hear this, that we recover the vocation of, of elders, because our culture, you know, has totally smashed that yeah. rite of passage as it's smashed the puberty rite of passage too. Right. But um, I think it's very important, and that's the role of elders. You see, commun communicate, especially with the youngest generation, because the middle ones in the middle, the parents, they're running things. They're too busy to think deeply and to see beyond the, you know, the Procter and Gamble who's paying their paycheck. You know, I mean, that's how life is. But I think that explains a lot, really, if it's accurate. And I, I think it is. This was a bona fide scientist who wrote this up, and I, I was very moved and hurt. But I could see both things. And the mythology thing rings true. And Brian talks about that, too. He talks a lot about symbolism and right. metaphor. Brian Swim, the cosmologist, symbol, the guy who told the story about the stadium. He's a physicist by trade. But he talks about the key between us and chimpanzees is symbolism and metaphor and um, therefore mythology. That, uh, that's how he talks about it. So he probably knows that book too. But it's, a, it's very important. And that's when you back up, you know, you look at religion and say, oh, well, here's, you know, when it's healthy and representative and doing its thing. But, and of course, now we have all kinds of mythologies, nation state mythologies and everything. But that's where, as you say, you still need some kind of, um, um, value, value stick to say, you know, some mythologies are more worthy than others. <laughs> yeah, well, mythologies can lead to seeing the other. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much. I, I don't know how I ended up a Jew, all of whose heroes are Catholic monks or previous Catholic <laughs> yeah, priests. Right. Merton, well, Anthony DeMello, Henry Nowen, um, <laughs> Tom.
Thomas Keating, you. Um, I've gained such inspiration and meaning. It's it's so interesting to me as a Jew, uh-huh. who first of all was taught to fear Christianity. Mm-hmm. To well, then, I mean, although that's we had a pretty good reasons. Yeah, I mean, although we had some very positive experiences with nuns and priests yeah. when uh-huh. I was a kid. Oh yeah, um, uh-huh. more in terms of the civil rights movement. Oh yeah, um, mm-hmm. but uh, it's amazing to me how much meaning has come from. Merton DeMello, mm-hmm. now in, yeah. um, and, and now you, uh, from the, you know, or at least with roots in the Catholic Church, which in some ways seems completely at odds <laughs> with what the Catholic Church is today. As you said, this intellectual, mystical pursuit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, the Catholic Church has its ups and downs. So it's- shadow this big this big that big that you know but then most human organizations do you know and uh but i want to say that i'm a thousand percent grateful to the jewish tradition when i did my master's thesis i said to myself the only way to renew christianity is to get back to judaism that everything else cuts us off from jesus and Jesus was a Jew. You can't understand Jesus without understanding his Jewishness. And um, of course, we now know he came from the wisdom tradition, which I love. I told you the stories about the Saturday masses, and the, and the course of prophetic tradition. He was obviously explicit about that. But um, so I learned so much from. I mean, Rabbi Asher was my favorite theologian. I've already said if I was alone or not, I went. I went. I went I went two books, Heschel and Howard Thurman. Hmm. And um, at the same time, I memorized these Christian mystics, Eckhart, and said, I don't need their books there. You know? <laughs> but the point is, Heschel, I go back to Heschel all the time. And I feel when I'm reading Heschel, I'm reading a teacher of Jesus. So he's a rabbi like Jesus was and who he, he worked with. So I... Uh, so I just want to say it works both ways. I'm glad you've gotten a lot from Catholicism. And there is so much richness there. And uh, I, I've certainly tried to bring those treasures out of the burning building. I've done so much on that card and Hildegard and Julia and Aquinas. So I'm there. But um, but the church can't, can't uh, hold it together very well. I'll tell you one compliment I got that I'll never forget years ago. The black pastor of the biggest black church in uh, in Oakland and the, and the most doing the best work you know just all, in all kinds of areas um, he, he said um, the BBC came to interview me or something during the the sciencing stuff and all that but before we could be doing but anyway they went to i said well you can go talk to him because i invited him to come and, and lecture at my program and he brought my original blessing book and i'll never forget his opening line he held it up and said see this book he said my people need this more than they need jobs <laughs> and i almost fell out of my chair he said because what slavery ultimately did to us was to take our dignity away and original blessing you know brings it back uh, so BBC went to introduce uh, to interview them, and they talked about me. And he said to BBC, he said, "Oh, he said, Matt Fox is so ahead of the church that the church confuses him with the enemy." <laughs> That's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. But it comes back, you know. I mean, poor guy, this guy was a fighter. I mean, he was a black pastor who had to hold so much together and did it, you know, over decades. He was, the, you know, the greatest black pastor in 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 in, in Oakland you know in a black was such a black city but but he said that <laughs> so far the church church confused him with the enemy I, I just thought well that names it you know it names it with humor and and accuracy you know I mean at least I want to believe that mm. that that's where my troubles come from <laughs> But I'm the enemy, but I'm a made up enemy. <laughs> well, I can tell you I'm, I'm one of, uh, as one person, I'm just grateful that you, as I said at the beginning, brought clarity to ideas that 
give me hope and meaning and direction for what it means to have to be in mystery and in faith at this time of civilization. So thank you so oh, much. Thank you. And thank you for doing what you're doing. This is wonderful, wonderful work. I think it's more important than you even know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you.